today. Um, I love the message about positivity. Um, I love the message about, you, know, you guys are already doing that. You're showing up here today. You're getting active. You're getting involved in your disease process. Um, if I leave you with anything today, especially for the folks in here with, with IPF, is that there's now some hope associated with being tr treated. Uh, if you flash back to two years ago, there really wasn't a whole lot of hope. Um, there was a lot of people struggling to get access to this medication. Um, and just as, it was, as was said earlier, there was a lot of work, um, over a decade of work, uh, that went into investigating this medication to get it on the market to, to offer some hope for patients with uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So I'm going to be jumping back and forth here just in my slides. Um, a couple things I have to say. This discussion is really limited to what's in the package insert. Uh, so that, that nice piece of paper that you get with any medication that you take. I'm going to try to keep it as interesting as I can and not sound like a drug commercial. Um, so I am an employee of Genentech. I'm presenting information that's associated and approved by Genentech. Any adverse events that I've discussed have already been reported to the FDA, so there's not a need to do that. Um, and just keep in mind that um, Genentech and the FDA keeps an eye on, on the discussions that I can have directly with patients. But I'm going to take us through a little bit about IPF more so about how Esbriet works, or profanidone works, uh, how it performed in the trials, and then how you can access the medication. So it's really about setting up expectations. Um, how, how is it gonna make you feel? Are you gonna feel any different? Uh, are there side effects? Uh, and what can you expect from the medication? Another thing I wanna put out there too is that if anyone has any questions along the way, please raise your hand and uh, we'll, we'll address them as we go. So. I'm not going to tell you about Genentech, but I am going to talk a little bit about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So when we break down what that means, idiopathic, that means we don't know exactly why this occurs. Uh, it's just a scientific name for an unknown cause. There's a number of theories out there. Some of those are related to GERD or reflux disease, um, but there's no tried and true agreed upon theory as to why this, this happens. Pulmonary, obviously another word for lung, and fibrosis is scarring. When you think about uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, it's unpredictable. Uh, unpredictable meaning how fast can you lose lung function. Uh, unpredictable meaning your IPF might be a different course than, a di than another patient with IPF. Uh, and it's a process of permanent scarring. We haven't gotten to that point where we can actually reverse some of that scarring. What we can do is slow down that process so it's not happening as quickly. So what happens in IPF? Like I said earlier, it's an injury, it's a fibrotic process. Um, I almost think of it as if you get a cut on your arm and that, you don't, don't get it sutured, you may have kind of a wide band of collagen there, a wide scar. It's kind of what's happening in the base of the lung over and over and over again. It's a repeated injury, so it's happening on a small and almost consistent basis. So that nice functioning lung down in, in the basin, and along on the outside of the lung, begin to start to be filled in with scar tissue. So when you think about back to high school biology, you take a deep breath in, it travels down the bronchial tree and it gets to this, what looks like a bunch of grapes here, uh, alveolus. If you looked at that under a slide, it's actually pretty, it's about one cell thick. And that's where oxygen comes into the bloodstream, carbon dioxide goes out. When you look at it in the case of pulmonary fibrosis, this nice, pretty, one cell thick circle becomes filled into the scar tissue. So it doesn't let oxygen come in, it doesn't let carbon dioxide come out. So we're losing that lung function at a faster rate. 
Uh, we know that it can, it can progress rapidly for some people and slowly for others. Uh, we heard a, a gentleman here that's had pulmonary fibrosis for, for 11 years. Um, we can, we can kind of lump people, though, into different groups. Um, if we take a look at this slide here, in terms of disease progression on the vertical axis and over time on the horizontal axis, we can drop people into kind of three basic groups. Um, this gentleman here obviously falls into the, the, the stable group, and that's about 10% of folks. These folks lose lung function, but very, very slowly. Most folks fall into this slow disease progression. So they're losing lung function at a faster rate than someone might normally. And we worry about them because if, if they end up getting sick, getting pneumonia, something like that, they can really drop off their baseline. Um, that's why vaccinations are important. Making sure you get the flu vaccine, making sure you get the pneumococcal vaccine. It's just part of, part of that bundle of care for you. Um, and then the remaining 10% kind of fall in this rapid disease progression. They lose lung function at a pretty fast rate, and that's really what we want to avoid and intervene with. So, like I said earlier, you guys made a positive choice. You're intervening in your care. When I say bundle of care, it includes some other things. Like you talked about pulmonary, pulmonary rehab, um, exercise, uh, but education too, right? Oh, um, medication too from Duke. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Prednisone, cell, cell site, yeah. cell set. There, there's uh, a, a lot of different things. Yeah. So you, not only pulmonary rehab, not only oxygen, not only taking care of GERD if it's there. Red wine. Um, <laughs> Hemoglobin. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of different things you can do to intervene in that disease process. It's not just the medication, but it's really taking an active role, letting your friends and family know about what, what happens in that disease process so they can help. And obviously, talking to your healthcare provider, talking to your doctor, making sure you get steered in the right direction. You have questions about medication, um, and we can provide that bundle of care for you. So what is ESBRIAD? So in October of 2014, the FDA approved on the same day ESBRIAD and Refeb, two medications for the treatment of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. They didn't say whether it was mild or moderate severe. They, they had a broad indication for the treatment of IPF. And what does it do? It helps to preserve lung function and slow disease progression. So when we go back to that, the discussion about what happens in IPF, that scarring at the base of the lung, we're slowing that process down and hopefully holding on to more lung function, holding on to it for as long as we can um, uh, with this type of medication. So certain things, if you're thinking about Esbriet, that you should let your doctor know. Any medication that you take orally goes through the liver. They're going to do a liver function test for you, or liver enzymes. They'll do it at baseline. And the recommendation is once a month for the first six months and quarterly thereafter. So they'll usually give you a prescription to get that blood test. The difference in the, the, the trials and the package insert was about 25 to 3%. Those folks had elevated liver enzymes. So we keep a close eye on it. <laughs> Nobody in the studies had liver failure, uh, permanent liver damage, any of those types of things. If your doctor notices your liver enzymes go up, they may back off the dose, or they may go ahead and stop it entirely. Um, keep in mind, too, there's another medication out there, so you, there are two choices that are for you. Um, they're going to ask you about kidney problems. They're also going to ask you not to smoke. Um, smoking inter intervenes with how this medication is absorbed. Um, so it's going to not let you get the full uh, benefits of the medication if you are currently smoking. Um, and they'll ask you about other things too, in terms, including pregnancy and breastfeeding, if that's applicable. So, some key things about Esbriet. Um, like I said, it had been developed over well over a decade um, in other areas of the, the um, world. Got access to the, this medication first in Canada in Europe. Um, the nice part about that is, is there's over 15,000 people worldwide that have been on Esbriet. And why is that important? Well, there's three clinical trials, so you have about 1,250 patients in the clinical trials. But you also have a, a wide array of people who are taking it out in the real world. Um, and that's important because we get data back about side effects. Um, hopefully we're getting data back about how it works. Um, so we can provide clearer answers as time goes on. 
um, to, to what we can exactly expect from the medication. When we look at three clinical studies, like I said, about 1,250 patients, um, Esri has been proven to preserve lung function in some patients with IPF, and it can cause side effects, which we'll talk about in detail in just a moment. So Esri is an FDA-approved option to treat IPF. A key thing about this is starting and staying on Esri. Like I said, there are side effects that can come with it, and I almost think of this as like um, uh, in the case of uh, lung cancer. You may be on chemotherapy, and there are side effects that come with that too. Some of those things can be mitigated. We can work through that process. It's similar with Esri. Um, if you have <coughs> stomach upset, there are certain things that we can do to hopefully maintain your quality of life and get the benefit of the medication. And I think that's the key thing to work with your healthcare provider on. If you are having any side effects in general, having a good line of communication either with your doctor's nurse or the doctor directly to make sure that you can let them know that this is happening so they can work through that process. A couple things that can happen. Esbriant is a medication, and there are other medications that can't cause this. It causes photosensitivity, meaning you can get a sunburn more easily uh, than you might if you weren't on the medication at all. So what they recommend is F SPF 50. When you're outside, reapplying that as it's instructed, usually about an hour and a half. Another thing to keep in mind, too, is um, if you're familiar with the, the manufacturer of Columbia, they make SPF-infused clothing that's lightweight, especially in the summertime. That's good. That's a good option if you're an outdoor person um, to keep in the back of your mind if you're on Esprit. It can happen. It happens about 10% of patients, so one out of 10 people will have it. Um, using a hat, just just keeping it in the back of your mind as you get to the summer months that that can happen. Um, and we already talked about avoiding smoking as it can affect how Esprit works. So. When we get to the three clinical trials that they did, I, I find it helpful to go back chronologically and, and tell you about how they did this. So there were two capacity trials, capacity is the name of the study. The difference between the two capacity trials is there was an intermediate dose in one of them. So meaning that there was a half dose to see what the response was in that. When they did, they did those, and they did a follow-up study called ASCEND, which was about a year long, they picked as an endpoint what they called forced vital capacity. So most of the folks in here have been through a pulmonary function test. When you go to your doctor, they ask you to take a deep breath in, you blast out that air as hard and as fast as you can for six seconds, and it feels like you, know, you just want to kind of pass out. Um, in, in doing that, and if you have a good effort when you deliver that test, we can find that that's objective. I Meaning if I did that for you three times and you gave good effort, I can say that your FEC is maybe 80% predicted. And percent predicted means it's based on what I would expect for you, or for me, for a 43-year-old man who's five foot seven inch, um, I can I have a predicted lung value. So they're comparing that to what they expect. 